welcome to this Green Alliance event. I'm Jess Shankleman, an energy and climate reporter for Bloomberg News, and I'm really pleased to be joined here by three expert speakers discussing what is the outcome of the US election for nature and climate. So Brendan Guy is a senior advisor to the Natural Resources Defence Council Action Fund, and he's an expert on international and US climate policy. Claire Healy is joining us from Washington, DC. She's the Director of Climate Diplomacy, Risk and Security at the think tank E3G, and she works to facilitate international cooperation and coordination on climate action. And Katie Eda is joining us from California. She's the co-founder and executive director of Future Coalition, a major force in the youth climate movement. So before we get going, a few bits of housekeeping. Um, if you want to pose questions to our speakers during the event, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, which will be monitored and read out later by Chris Venables of Green Alliance. Um, you also have the option to upvote questions from other attendees, which will make them more likely to be asked. And also the chat function is operational and you're welcome to use it with other attendees, but we won't be monitoring it. So don't use that if you want to ask questions. And if you'd like to tweet during the event, the hashtag is hashtag GA event. That's GA event. So it appears that Joe Biden is poised to claim the presidency from Donald Trump. A handful of states expect to complete their vote counts, um, though Republicans are opening some legal fights to stop counting in at least two states. At the moment, Biden holds 264 electoral college votes out of the 270 needed to win the White House, and Trump has 214, according to AP. So Biden has pledged to immediately rejoin the Paris Agreement and launch a two trillion climate and green recovery plan, which, which would effectively reverse many of the, the actions of Trump over the last four years. But having said that, even if Biden doesn't claim victory today, what we haven't seen is the strong blue wave that some polls show would have given Democrats control of both houses in Congress. So we're going to chat about that a bit today. Um, I'm going to start with Claire. What, what, do, what does what we know so far about the election outcome mean for global climate politics overall? What are the, what's the key threats and opportunities as you see them? Okay, uh, thank you, Jess, and thank you, Green Alliance, for inviting me for this uh, discussion. Okay, so if Biden wins the presidency, I'm looking on wood, um, uh, it would be a good day for the Paris Agreement. He has already tweeted out yesterday, he tweeted uh, that there are 77 days uh, before a Biden administration will rejoin the Paris Agreement. So, number one, like big picture, uh, a President Biden, uh, we know, you know, he's a known character. We know, A, he believes in science, B, he believes in multilateralism, and C, he's made climate and climate ambition a central theme of his campaign, right? So I think uh, not only would he rejoin, I think um, there are particular areas, I think it just opens a space for more multilateralism and cooperation, right? The question then becomes, how do we use that space? And so on climate, there are three things, I think. One, Paris and the formal climate diplomatic processes. So yes, we would expect him to rejoin, would expect a new NDC at some point during the year. Uh, that NDC has to be ambitious, as ambitious as possible. It also has to be credible. So this is where we get with the connection with the domestic policy. And I know Brendan's gonna say more about that, um, how credible that needs to be. There will also be a long-term commitment to net zero by 2050. So the US will, draw, will join that club and the race to net zero. And then the other point is, um, in terms of multilateralism and cooperation, is you know, the pandemic. Uh, the virus is still raging. Uh, just yesterday, 
cases exceeded 100,000 in the US. On election day, 1,100 Americans died from COVID-19. So this is a reality. Um, and so I think if President Biden would also look to cooperate with countries and figure out how A, we get, you know, share information, develop a vaccine, get this pandemic under control. And two, how we do, as he said, his transition website is called Build Back Better. And I think he would take that also globally and have that conversation. How do we recover? And I think green recovery is still on the agenda internationally and also domestically. Um, so I do think there are lots of possibilities. Um, I'm not sort of panglossian about what can be achieved. I'm sure this will come out in the discussion, but it, being pragmatic, there's lots that we can do. And foreign policy is one area where a President Biden and a Biden administration would have more freedom. So we would expect him and his administration to lean in on climate. And that's good news. What does it, what does it mean for COP26? That's the next big global climate event um, this time next year. The UK is the president. What, does it, what, what will the UK as a, as a host country be thinking about at, at this point in time? So um, with uh, one of my daughters at home being homeschooled at the moment because of the pandemic. Um, so with COP26, I think, again, broad, we've got to take a broader perspective, like climate ambition. We need to see like 2020 and 2021. This is the year we've got to set up for deep decarbonisation. So the COP26, I think, is not just an event on the diplomatic calendar. It is a window to the next decade. And so first of all, I think, you know, given that the pandemic and the, the calendar is in flux and the COP26 is at the end of the year, we've really got to look across other diplomatic processes. Also, which the UK as president of the G7 of the COP26, we've got to think more broadly about how we mainstream climate over the next 12 to 18 months. And so in terms of, you know, if fossil fuel subsidy reform is on the agenda still, how we get a development finance and a debt package to so show solidarity with other countries struggling with the pandemic, you know, how we have those conversations about mainstreaming climate in those other spaces, um, I think is key. And then landing some of that ambition at the COP. I do think with the UK and uh, uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, I do think the fact that climate is a sort of card that he can use in calling on a new administration in the US. And I think he'd be wise to use it early on, but from a much broader perspective. So, you know, and, you know, as I said, I, I, I have a reaction when we look at COP as a, just an event. I think we've got to think of it as a window. So I think it, it opens up lots of possibilities. So Biden said that um, if he becomes president, he'll aggressively push other countries to act on climate. And actually, what we've already seen, regardless of that, you know, China, Japan, South Korea, all uh, committing to net zero targets anyway in the last six weeks. But but with um, you know, if, if Biden doesn't, if the, if the Democrats don't have control of the Senate, how realistic is it that he can ag aggressively do that? How that he can that he can lean on other countries and, and actually convince them to, to toughen up their, their actions? So I think, I mean, yeah, credibility, I think, is a key word, right? And I think also humility. The good thing about a President Biden, let's say, his, um, this is not his first time at the rodeo, right? He's been around for quite a while, right? So he, A, has good relationships with other world leaders, uh, and I think he would use that. And I think they know him as a straight talker and a trusted character. And everybody, I think, is appreciative of sort of the domestic uh, situation that everybody in. Nonetheless, uh, the US, I think, will, jo will join that club and race to net zero. You know, Biden also will have relationships with Republicans in the Senate and across the aisle. I think he'll draw on those to get, I think, more pragmatic deals done. I, I know Brenda will say more about that. I do think, look, the, the energy, the clean, the transition to a clean economy is underway, right? It's, and, we can talk about technology and economics and you know the financial system as well as public support and you know increasingly public protest wanting this and that's true in the us it's true in blue and red states so that's happening regardless of what happens at the us federal at federal level right so the question is that that is the direction of travel that's the direction we're going in um the question is the speed and the pace and what what it would mean if we get the 
you know, US federal levers and traction, you know, back in the game, we could do a lot more. But um, nonetheless, I think um, with a President Biden, I think, uh, I think he'll, I think he'll do, I think we'll be able to get a lot further and we need to be grateful for that than the alternative. Uh, the question is how fast we get there. And that does depend on the domestic situation. Um, so Brendan, I want to ask you about domestic policy. Um, Claire talked about the net zero target that he, uh, Biden has said that he would set. Um, how does he, how does he do that? How, how does he set a net zero, 20, 2050 net zero target and, and when? Yeah, thank you, Jess, and thanks everyone for joining to unpack the results uh, live as they're, they're happening and still rolling in. Um, so maybe I can circle back to, to net zero and kind of go through a bit of the domestic pieces and how that can uh, you know, add up and kind of get towards uh, that trajectory. So I think the first thing just to really emphasize is that uh, you know, if Joe Biden is elected president, uh, clearly that is going to be a complete about phase from the Trump administration, particularly on climate and nature. Uh, and just to add a little flavor in terms of uh, doing this all live while election results are still coming in, it seems like you know key results are going to be coming in in Georgia, Nevada, likely at the top of this call. Uh, Pennsylvania is still uh, looking likely uh, for for Biden, uh, possibly tomorrow as early as tomorrow. So I think you know that it is looking much more likely that that's going to be the outcome. Um, but then of course you know it does a lot of his agenda does depend on the composition of Congress. Uh, so I think that the balance of power right now in the Senate is a little too close to call. It's 48-48 uh, right now as we speak. Uh, and it's looking likely uh, that there might be even one or two runoff elections in, in Georgia on January 5th that actually determine who's going to have the majority. So lots in flux, lots in play, uh, but I'll try and speak a little bit to, to what we know right now. Um, so I think in terms of getting on a trajectory to net zero, um, of course, that is going to require legislation. There's no way to get uh, on track for net zero without legislation. So some of those efforts are, are not going to be as accelerated uh, as a President Biden might have hoped. But I think there's still a lot that he can do uh, to really uh, start pushing that agenda forward actually quite quickly, even from day one. Um, even just with um, current executive authority that he has. And I think you've, you've heard uh, him say this on the campaign trail and would probably translate uh, to him being president, you know, climate change is a priority. And I think even especially now it's going to be linked with other priorities such as, uh, you know, infrastructure, clean infrastructure, clean, good paying jobs, uh, you know, social and racial equity, uh, those types of issues. Um, but I think, you know, he's not going to take his foot off the gas on, on putting that forward, even if, uh, you know, his, his tools are slightly different. So what would that actually look like? Um, you know, I think uh, beyond just restoring uh, some of the Trump rollbacks, which is kind of uh, an obvious no brainer. Uh, and, and really orchestrating a whole of government approach um, to the, the climate crisis. I think you'd see action in a couple of different key areas um, in terms of executive action from President Biden. So that can include things like methane standards for new oil and gas operations. That could include things like uh, energy efficiency standards for buildings, appliances. That could include things like corporate risk disclosure requirements, um, and that could also include things such as clean power plant, uh, clean power plant, and clean car standards. Uh, obviously, those have to be crafted in a way uh, that can withstand legal challenges uh, from a more conservative uh, judicial branch, especially the Supreme Court. Uh, but I think you'll see them really looking at every single possible lever that they can be pulling um, to try and advance action towards that net zero, net zero trajectory, because he, he does know that, uh, you know, we have to be aligning with the science. We have to be listening to the science, not just on COVID-19 and the health pandemic, uh, but obviously on climate. And I think he, he and his team do get that. So as much as they can be pulling some of those levers um, to try and, uh, you know, bend the curve down towards net zero, I think they will. That's great. And just a reminder to everyone watching that um, please do put your, your questions in the Q&A for Chris, who's, who's watching out for them, and he'll, he'll read them out. Um, so, Brendan, are there any particular states that we should be looking at where the election so far might have made a real difference when it comes to, for example, um, pushing on renewable energy? I don't know, I'm thinking maybe about Maine. Yeah, no, I, I think we're, we're all kind of still un unpacking the results a little bit. I think in, in terms of, of Maine, I think the, the big thing for, for that um, race on the Senate side was that um, the senator from Maine, the Republican, was re-elected, uh, Senator Susan Collins, who uh, is one of the more moderate uh, parts of the Republican Party uh, and has shown some uh, you know, interest and willingness to be able to work with 
Democrats on climate and energy policy because that is seen as a, as a priority for the people of Maine. Uh, and the other one is, is in Alaska, is Senator Murkowski, um, who, again, not, not quite as far as some people might hope, but again, has shown some interest to looking at possible areas for, for working together on climate and energy issues. So may, maybe just to tease out a little bit of some of the kind of creative political opportunities that might exist. Um, even if there is a Republican controlled Senate, um, I think there's uh, you know, definitely some room um, to, to get, a, again, a little bit creative uh, and build on, on some of Joe Biden's uh, you know, relationships that he built in the Senate. Obviously, he knows how the Senate works. He's, he was there for, for three plus decades. Um, so I think a couple of things you could imagine looking at, uh, especially early on, would be uh, a major stimulus effort uh, that could include uh, clean infrastructure and really focus on good paying um, kind of clean and green jobs. You could imagine, uh, you know, clean energy or clean vehicle tax credits or subsidies um, being an area for, for potential bipartisan uh, alignment. You could imagine uh, innovation, the energy innovation agenda, including through uh, fairly substantial research and development funding, being an area for potential cooperation. Uh, Nature-based solutions. I think you've seen, uh, you know, Republicans coming along a little bit more to uh, at least the need for, uh, you know, nature-based solutions, and uh, that's a good start. Obviously, we have to go further than that. Um, and then there's always opportunities in terms of some of the, the must-pass legislation that goes through Congress, whether that's on uh, defense issues or other kind of key issues that have to be passed. You, you know, there, there are creative ways to, to be able to build in climate and clean energy priorities into those. So that's kind of a, a more macro federal level. I think, you know, at the state level, obviously, there will continue to be opportunities to push uh, strong clean energy. Uh, and efficiency standards, and even without some of those policies, you know, even in, in Texas, Oklahoma, you know, fairly Republican states, um, they are driving forward very rapidly with, uh, you know, wind energy, uh, especially just because they see uh, the economic benefits, um, even if they're not doing it for climate reasons. So I think there there will be opportunities. Uh, we'll we'll just have to kind of see exactly what the landscape uh, portends. So where, where does the Republican Party go from here? If we're looking at potentially uh, a Biden win, um, you know, for the last four years, it's been aggressively anti, anti um, you know, tackling climate change, pulling out of the Paris Accord. What, what does the narrative become for the, for the Republican Party for the next four years on, on climate change? Yeah, I, I think it's an it's an open question. I mean, um, if they do uh, retain the Senate, I think they they will feel uh, you know slightly emboldened. Um, but I, I, again, I don't think that's going to necessarily constrain some potential areas for for cooperation. I think you have seen a lot of shifts in the not necessarily in the political apparatus of the Republican Party, but in the Republican Party kind of writ large itself. So. For example, Republican uh, younger voters are really starting to push uh, some of the politicians on climate and energy issues. Um, I think you you saw that uh, you know even in, in this election was was uh, you know some Republican candidates starting to position themselves to be able to be more constructive on the issue, and I think uh, in 2022 there's going to be a, an even more difficult um, Senate race uh, for Republicans um, with a lot of more vulnerable senators who are up, and I think you're going to see a lot of pressure on them, uh, you know, to to come to the table uh, just given the popularity of clean energy issues. You know, it's polling again. Who who knows how much exactly we can trust polls these days, but I think, uh, you know, it's pretty broadly accepted that, you know, well over two thirds of the, uh, you know, kind of younger Republican voters and, and even some independents uh, have strong support for transitioning towards clean energy. So I think you will see them start to feel that pressure a lot more. Um, and as especially as they're thinking about, uh, you know, trying to uh, maintain their seats in a 2022 election, I think that will be able to bring them to the table on some of these issues a lot more and provide some leverage points. Um, but again, still, it's not going to be, uh, you know, a total, uh, you know, see the light moment where they where they, they turn around and realize the the error of their ways. But uh, I think, you know, some of this building pressure, especially from the Republican grassroots and from others, um, I think will will hopefully uh, provide some uh, creative opportunities. And, and so I use the opportunity talking about young people to turn to Katie. Uh, so there's no doubt it's been a rough couple of years for the grassroots climate movement. How are you feeling today about, about what's happening? What gives you hope? And what do you see as the major battlegrounds in the weeks and months ahead? 
Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think we're sitting on a, on a nail biter still um, to sort of see what, what the, how the results shake out um, and then how close we get. Um, you know, I think it, 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 as far as hope goes, I think that, you know, we are, we're really pleased with the youth turnout. I'm actually going to drop a link for those of you that um, are, are on your computers in the chat to see um, that of, of um, um, some, uh, some data that came out yesterday that shows if it had, the race had just been um, young people under 35, what, um, what the results would have looked like. And, you know, across the board, young people are voting more progressive, even in states that, that, that are, you know, sort of traditionally more deep, deep, deep red states in the South. Um, so I think across the board, we're really glad that young people showed up. And I think um, looking at sort of moving forward, um, it gives me a lot of hope to know that as our generation sort of transitions um, to, to sort of become older and sort of take more of the, the sort of traditional places of leadership and power, um, that we'll be able to see a more progressive agenda across the board, especially on climate. Um, and so sort of the conversations that the youth movement is, is sort of having these last two days is really around sort of this long term strategy and how we're going to implement it, you know, really running young people um, across the board in elections in, in 2022 and beyond. Um, and so I think it's very exciting that we saw this kind of turnout from young people um, and young people were engaged in the process in this way. I think at the same time, you know, I think where there there is fear and, and where there, you know, the kind of opposite side of that coin is that while we can sort of look to this long term strategy um, to sort of bring the US back to sort of being a hopefully progressive leader on the global on the sort of global stage, that when it comes to climate, we just don't have that kind of time. We don't have the time to wait for sort of this generation to take that 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 and claim that power and that leadership sort of um, in, in Washington, DC. And so I think that um, the sort of claiming of power is is going to really need to be seen on the streets and I think that's what we're we're expecting to do um, our our movement has really pushed Biden Biden ran on the most progressive uh, climate policy plan that we've we've seen um, much of it uh, based off the Green New Deal which is the you know the framework that um, the youth movement has really sort of championed in the US uh, and so I think in many ways we're, we're we're hopeful for the for a Biden administration and to be able to push Biden as far as we can go obviously you know we're we were hoping to win the Senate I, I've not lost hope i believe we can push these two georgia seats to the to to, to run off and and have a real sort of um, uh, interesting show in January to see, you know, if we can grab the majority in the Senate. Um, but I think, you know, regardless, the role of young people going forward, I think is really going to be to follow up our, our voting in the streets. And, and, and that's exactly what folks are, are prepared to do. Um, and I'm really excited to, to see how that goes. And I think that, you know, a sort of big key um, kind of strategy in, in what we're thinking is expanding our targets. Um, right now, so much of our work has been focused on this election, has been focused on sort of the political pillar that's upholding the fossil fuel industry and I think expanding into the financial space and expanding our targets um, to villainizing folks that are enabling the fossil fuel industry in other ways um, and also highlighting the government's role in sort of enabling the finance the um, sort of uh, the finance industry in upholding the fossil fuel industry. Um, so I think that there's sort of a lot of a lot of plays and a lot of angles that allow us to sort of expand our energy on the streets to prepare for not just the Biden administration, but also hopefully then if, if not flipping the Senate now, flipping the Senate in 2022. Great. So you mentioned um, that you're going to, you, you know, a potential President Biden, you push him to go further. Where would you push him to go further? And where would you cut in some slack? Um, yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, I think that, you know, Biden and his administration would serve as an opportunity to, to be a leader on the global stage. I think that, you know, what we saw sort of um, during the Obama administration, as much as, um, you know, um, we, we didn't see the kind of climate policy I think we could we could have, um, given, um, you know, the control that we had at that point in time. I think we saw real leadership when it came to um, sort of the, the Paris negotiations. Um, you know, I think my guess is John Kerry, who played a key pivotal role, and that will play a role in, in the administration around Biden's climate work as well. Um, and so I think what we'll see is a lot of players that served as leaders sort of four years ago coming back um, um, again uh, within the Biden administration. Um, I think that there's a number, you know, Biden himself, um, and there's actually a really great website, um, I believe it's climatepresident.org, which goes through all of the different steps um, that um, uh, sort of as an ex as the executive action that Biden could take a, a day one um, that would sort of without um, Congress uh, 
of the act of, of, of action that he could take. Um, and so I think we'll definitely be pushing Biden on that executive action. Um, and then I think we'll be, you know, pushing on just the, I think, across the board, even if we don't have majority, um, sort of pushing Biden and the other Democratic leadership in the House and in the Senate um, on their policy. So when there are uh, open windows to, to, to pass legislation, that will be able to push as bold legislation as we can. So I, I want to go back just to talk about the UK, because um, I know a lot of our audience are based in the UK. Um, obviously, uh, a Biden administration could have quite uh, big implications for the future of a trade deal with the US, um, as the UK is hoping to get after Brexit. What do you think the implications are, particularly in terms of climate, Brendan? Yeah, so trade politics is likely to be very, very challenging um, given the current composition of Congress and especially more so if there is a Republican controlled Senate. Um, it's pretty hard to imagine um, any GOP senator supporting anything that could be called, you know, potential tax increase or constraining U.S. energy exports. So I think it, it is going to be, you know, difficult on the trade front for sure to try and incorporate climate into that as Biden had been, um, you know, promoting and hoping for during, during the campaign. Um, I think uh, in terms of UK, US trade deal specifically, I think uh, clearly there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, bandwidth, uh, not a lot of bandwidth for, for a number of priorities in the early days of the administration. So where that kind of shakes out, given everything they're going to have to do and how much effort they're going to be having to, to put into, uh, you know, dealing with potentially a kind of unruly or uncooperative Congress. Um, who knows? Hard, hard to tell. Um, I guess the, the kind of main thing is just the time frame is, is very, very tight. Um, so the, I think it's the early April, April 2nd deadline um, to complete a UK-US trade deal in order to sign it before the kind of um, fast track authority expires in, in July uh, is very quick uh, to try and turn a trade deal around. Um, that, that fast track uh, authority basically allows the, um, you know, an up or down vote in Congress. Um, Congress can't amend it. They can't kind of do anything with it. It's, you know, do we like this or do we not like this? Um, but then that expires um, in July of next year. So if you don't have that kind of fast track authority, um, you know, you could just imagine every single interest group piling every single one of their priorities into one of these trade deals and it just never going anywhere. So I think probably one of the biggest things is, you know, if you're not able to get, get it done um, by that April, early April deadline, um, and is the, the big question then becomes is, is this trade, uh, fast track trade um, promotion authority, is that extended um, if there's a Republican Senate, which um, could be, but it, it also could be could be bogged down for a long time as well, too. And, and again, if, if you don't have that, that fast track authority, I don't think many trade deals are going uh, very, very far, very fast. It could take a little while. So uh, again, some, somewhat to be determined based on the composition of the, of the Senate, Senate, but if it's Republican, uh, it seems like definitely an, an uphill climb. And Claire, in terms of um, thinking about Brexit, I guess climate at the moment is one area where the UK is actually looking not too bad. I mean, we're not dealing that well with the COVID crisis, where you know, the, Brexit, the Brexit negotiations are really like coming down to a nail-biting end. Um, could a, a Biden win slightly undermine the, US, uh, the UK's um, status in terms of uh, climate diplomacy? If you know, Biden comes in and is able to kind of lead the way, does that make the UK uh, suddenly look quite small in all of this? Um, yes, uh, the risk is yes. Um, Jess, can I just address, uh, I've just been looking at the chat, some of the themes coming up that I, you know, I, I don't want us to give an overly rosy uh, perspective here, right? So um, I'm from the UK originally, I'm a, I'm a dual citizen, right? And back in the day, I used to work for the Labour Party doing policy. And so I do think, uh, you know, we are, as on a personal note, I think it is disappointing we didn't see the blue wave that you, you know, said at the, the top end, right? Uh, I think um, that's what the polls led us to believe. And I think, you know, personally speaking, I think we were, I was hoping to see sort of a, a, a more of a repudiation of say some of the uh, ugliness, some of the politics we've seen of late, right? And the truth of the matter is, uh, while it, if Biden wins, a win is a win, and we'll go with that, but I think it is personally very disappointing that we didn't see that blue wave. The numbers have gone up, 
on both sides, like Biden's vote has gone through the roof, but so has Trump's, right? And so um, the country is very polarized, right? There's no getting around that. And, you know, um, we're all coming to terms with that, okay? So while we didn't see the blue wave, um, hopefully we'll see this blue wall, you know, stay solid, right? Um, fingers crossed, don't want to tempt fate. So that will then determine again, something that closes the space for some action, right? So maybe like trade becomes more problematic, you know, coal, gas becomes a bit more political, right? Because you've got to look at the, the this will sort of cement, you know, Biden will have to do more for the quote unquote, the left behind, the white working class vote in those constituencies, right? So it opens up possibilities in other areas, like right? So we do need to think harder as a movement about the just transition, and um, the social contract and broader social policy, right? Because if we zoom out on our goal from a climate perspective, if it is to halve global emissions in a decade, that is pretty disruptive. And uh, E3G, and I think like generally when I used to work at the Labour Party as well on policy, sometimes it's a good reminder to us what we think should happen. We, you know, we deal a lot with shoulds, right? And the reality is shoulds, is, you know, doesn't make for a good, you know, people don't, shoulds don't always happen, right? So we've got to then go back, go back to basics and think about, okay, how do we do that? How do we make it happen? So I don't want viewers to think we're being overly optimistic, right? We are deeply, well, I should say we, I am deeply disappointed, right? That's a whole personal conversation. But again, like from a climate diplomacy or a geopolitical or multilateral conversation, there's lots of space and a Biden win just opens up a lot, you know, just a lot more traction, right? Um, uh, but then domestically, we can do we can do it. We can do a lot. Uh, your, to your question about the UK, I think um, yes, Brexit. I think you know Biden. I think was obviously um, came out very early, very strong against Brexit being a good idea, right? Um, President, uh, I was say President Boris, uh, Prime Minister Johnson. I think generally in the US, is seen as being very close to President Trump, um, and so. Um, but the UK is a good ally and partner to the US, it always has been, and so is Europe. So I think the, US, the UK with Europe post Brexit, I think uh, the, and a, a US, even if it is um, more polarized, uh, sli slightly constrained, I think a, a US Biden administration, I think will lean a lot on Europe and the UK um, to sort of uh, get a lot done on the international stage again, because there is a pandemic raging countries are like potentially could default right so i do think again the uk we've got to think broader than cop 26 that they're, they're leading the g7 we need an awful lot of action in the g7 on finance again one of your listeners in the chat talked about the debt issue right so on finance a lot could be done right in terms of finding new financing to support recovery right um uh, the fiscal space issue, again, that's, that's universal across developed countries and developing countries and emerging markets. There's a lot of space there that a US administration under President Biden with the UK and Europe could actually advance some genuine solutions. And again, and underneath all of that mainstreaming climate throughout, right? So I, th I do think there's a lot in the next 18 months that we could work with, with UK hosting those presidencies uh, with the president, with the Biden administration and Europe, we could make a lot of progress. You see, you talked about some of the creative things that a President Biden could do to try and um, have progressive climate action, even without the Senate. Can you can you give me some examples of what what they could be? Maybe kind of looking back a bit historically to what, for example, Obama might have done in a in a similar situation. Is that question to me? Yes. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, okay. So. Um, um, so, I mean, Obama, like, so uh, let me pick, let me pick a couple, right? So I'm going to say about finance and I'm going to talk about innovation and sort of technology, right? I mean, A, you have a power convening, uh, actually three, I think on the risk and resilience front, the finance front and the innovation front, right? So a Biden administration as an executive with all the agencies can A, join up a lot of the dots, um, and do a lot of convening both within the US and internationally of public actors as well as private actors. Um, so on finance, again, a lot of work is already being done to reorient our financial system. 
And that, you know, that's not going to stop. That's only going to accelerate. And a President Biden could, with the, all the appointments across the multilateral development banks, the IMF, you know, potentially the Fed would get, get given a different mandate, could join all these other platforms that are reorienting the financial system. So that can accelerate. And at the end of the day, how fast we decarbonize depends like what banks and businesses decide to finance and what then they don't, right? And they get, I think most of them, the writing on the wall. So that will only accelerate. Uh, on the innovation and technology side, the net zero club, I think, you know, saying you're going to decarbonize your, get to net zero by 2050, uh, that's 20 years, it's, what, 30 years away, right? So that technology innovation front, again, the US bringing that to bear, joining with Europe, the UK, China, and Asia, and other partners, figuring out how we do that. And, you know, with that, with that spirit of like, we don't know how we're going to do it, let's join together and figure this out. So Mission Innovation, another platform that the UK has the secretary of, again, that I think opens up a lot of space um, for cooperative action on the technology front, the research, development, and deployment. And then um, the other issue is the risk side and the resilience side, right? So the reality is, um, well, the reality is just the reality, right? The site, these impacts are only going to get worse. So the, the effects are going to be felt, uh, you know, throughout the US increasingly, right? So um, I think on the risk side, there's a lot that could be done to mobilize those impacted groups and communities. And also the US, I think under the Obama administration, they put, they had a big task force and they did a lot in terms of the institutional building and changing the rules and the defaults and the modeling in order to sort of shift financing and investment. And I would expect to see under a Biden administration a much more robust sort of resilience agenda. And I'm not, and when I use the word resilience, I'm not just talking in terms of adaptation and resilience to climate impact. I'm generally talking resilience to economic shocks. Because again, this COVID pandemic has shown, particularly in the US, um, how fragile and you know, the lack of a social safety net. So I think this whole resilience agenda will also sort of take on um, much more energy under a Biden administration. And they could do an awful lot to help strengthen resilience to shocks. Brendan, I don't know if you want to chip in on that or Katie. Katie, go ahead, go ahead if you'd like. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, I, I dropped this link in the chat earlier, which is something um, a really comprehensive plan that I would really encourage checking out. I would say that probably one of the key um, actions that Bi the Biden administration can take without Congress um, is the expansion of new um, fossil fuel projects. You might remember back um, sort of right around the 2016 election, there's a lot of protests, protests happening um, around the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, and Obama, the Obama administration was able to halt that expansion through an executive order. And so that is, um, you know, a very similar actions we could see Biden take in, which is most likely what the move movement, youth movement will take up um, as one of sort of the key demands is to stop that new expansion of fossil fuel projects. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that villainizing of the fossil fuel industries from a movement building perspective is, um, is a strategy that we are really kind of planning to take up. And so I think that um, really kind of painting this picture of of the fossil fuel industry and, and all of its enablers as the villains and offering an opportunity for the Biden administration and Congress and, and political leaders as on the whole um, and providing them an opportunity and space to become those heroes in sort of that narrative and that story is going to be a really key um, strategy in seeing action both on the executive from the executive branch um, but then I think looking at you know anything that would be bipartisan across the board I think um, adds to that as well. And Katie, what's your um, proposition? Because Claire was just talking about the need for a just transition. And I think that's been like highlighted more than ever this year with the inequality shown by the coronavirus pandemic. If you're villainizing the fossil fuel industry, what's, what's the youth movement's proposition for ensuring that those people who have uh, jobs in those industries don't get left you know, unemployed and even more resentful than they, they might already be? 
that is, you know, that's, that is the question, right? Is how do we approach this from, from, from a, a pathway that um, is, is, is going to, to happen in a just way. It's going to create new um, good paying union jobs. Uh, and I think it's, it's really a question of this narrative and this story. I mean, it is very clear that the U.S. buys into narrative and story over, you know, anything else. Um, if this election tells us one thing is that what we've believed to be true is, is not fact at all. It's just the story that we've been telling ourselves. And so I think this really goes to show how powerful story how powerful narrative it is um, and if we're telling the story that you know the, the it's not the fossil fuel industry you know it's not the it's not folks that are working in the fossil in fuel industry across the board it's folks that have the power to make changes and that's who sits at the top um, and and I, you know I'll just repeat again it's not the, just the fossil fuel industry itself but it's also the enablers of the fossil fuel industry right and um, it's it's banks for financing fossil fuel projects it's um, uh, institutions for continuing to invest in fossil fuels and and those folks again it's you know, it's not folks that are working at the bank branches. It's, um, you know, the folks who are really at the top that are able to make those decisions uh, and, and able to make that action, you know, even quite faster than we would be able to see from, um, from the government. Uh, and so it's really, I think it goes to um, so much of this is going to be is what is the story that we come out of the gate with and what is the narrative that we're telling people and that we're telling the rest of the world. And I think if we can set ourselves up in a way that's going to offer an opportunity for, um, you know, the the, the, for the Biden administration and for, you know, I think government players as a whole to act in that hero position and to sort of help move the needle, um, but doing so in a way that's going to really push it through an environmental justice lens, that's going to really push it through a just transition lens, um, I think is going to be really key across the board. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on that, actually. Uh, those are really, really excellent points um, that Katie just made. Um, so two things to follow up on that. On the fossil fuel side, um, kind of more on the policy side first, and I'll go to the, the narrative side. Um, Biden made a commitment during the campaign to seek a G20 um, commitment to, to phase out um, fossil fuel uh, subsidies through the G20. This had been a commitment right during the G7, during President Obama, obviously had not been, uh, you know, realized or acted on. Uh, I think, you know, the domestic agenda is going to be there's some things he can do under uh, you know existing authority. Obviously, uh, you know would like to have more that he can do through Congress. Um, but I think on the international side, there's definitely a lot of room um, to to kind of take that agenda and move forward with it. Um, so there's a lot he can do to uh, you know restrict, for example, coal financing through multilateral uh, you know institutions. Um, using the U.S. Vo voice and its votes and its influence at multilateral development banks, including the, the IMF and, and others, uh, to really uh, push fossil fuels, uh, not just subsidies, but kind of broader, you know, exports um, kind of out of the system a, a lot faster than they would have been otherwise. So I think uh, that's a place where they have a lot of leeway to be able to, to push that agenda, which is encouraging. Uh, and then the second point uh, to, to Katie's point as well, too, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the, the narrative is just so powerful and so important. And I think us, uh, you know, often we often get lost in the, the policy wonkery details, uh, which is good and important. But I, I think, again, exactly to what Katie and that the whole youth movement are doing is building this power of, uh, you know, these these values that should be we should be, you know, just selling left, right and center of you know clean air, clean water healthier, more inclusive, more vibrant communities uh, that actually sustain us rather than diminish us and, and you know, pollute our, our communities. So I think all those things, you know, are, it's obviously they're winning issues or they should be winning issues. And I think we just need to be a lot better at, at creating those narratives and, and telling those stories. And I think, uh, you know, the, the youth movement is certainly leading the charge on that. So we, uh, we all need to kind of lean into that a little bit more rather than just spending all of our time uh, figuring out the wonky policy details. Um, uh, I, well, I, I know Claire's already answered a few of your questions in the in the chat, but I want to give um, you, the, our panelists a chance to answer more of them. So, Chris, I think you've been looking through um, and picking out some of the most upvoted ones. What 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 are people asking? Yeah, uh, that's right, Jess. And um, uh, uh, we had a few in advance as well, so I, I, I think that's right. But a, a, a lot of the questions that have been asked have been touched on. Uh, in uh, in what's been said so far, but, uh, but certainly just to kind of pick up on where we ended there with the point about narrative, I think the the most kind of prominent question is is around the issue of polarization and um, and how to overcome that both kind of practically uh, in um, 
in Washington as to how you might push things through, but, but also politically how, how you might bring people together. So I think I, I think there's a question there around, you know, our, our, what are the hopes for uh, kind of uh, a, a less partisan a narrative and politics around climate change in the US and 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 what steps might um, uh, Biden, if he is elected the president, take to, uh, uh, take to try and uh, make that happen? Shall I kick off with that? Because I mean, that is, I think, the um, ultimate question and one that I don't have an answer for, but I'm struggling with. Um, because again, you know, sort of fairly old fashioned, and I used to think politics was a means of actually trying to solve some problems, right? And um, that's why it's somewhat disheartening um, the uh, sort of the results, right? Because how do we ask people to uh, like decarbonize, right? The rate that we need to, the science says we must, and, 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 and face that level of disruption in their lives when with Biden, as Brennan said, has great policies, right? That actually tries to marry, you know, how we're gonna rejig the economy. So it is fair, so we get fossil fuels out and we get fairness in, right? So they have very detailed policies, how we're gonna do that. Hillary did, Biden has. And yet that doesn't seem to be winning over, you know, um, uh, it is winning over a lot of people, but not half the people, right? So. We can, you know, narrative is very important. And when you look at sort of the narrative from sort of President Trump, it's very black and white, right? It's, okay, we can take issue with it, but it's black or white, right? That's it. And then we come in, you know, but even our sort of slogans, build back better and all the policies, just, I don't know why it's just not resonating, right? So that is a struggle, right? And I think there'll be a reckoning um, on the Democrat side, regardless of the results, right? Again, and I just want to say, if we, you know, again, I'm, praying and everything is crossed that there is a Biden win and Biden becomes president there's a lot we can do and there'll still be a reckoning and I feel that myself right you know will we too cautious will we too centrist like how do you be radical and if you were more progressive who extra comes out to vote for you that didn't vote this time right and so what, what it means for the future I think is a big question but I don't think we can go there yet. I think we've got to like pause, get the results, celebrate the win if it is a win, all right? And then figure out what we do and there's a lot that can be done. And then take some time, I think, to pause and diagnose and get into the detail before then we construct or go back to the drawing board and figure out how do we get the narrative right, the policy offer right. I do think it is about, on the climate side, I think it is, we have to make, Economy work. Um, it hasn't for a while. It's not fair and it's not sustainable and it's not balanced. We have these crises that keep showing that. So I do think it's a bigger, broader agenda, which again, the UK as chair of the G7 and working with Italy as chair of the G20 could really start to get that debate going, I think, with a President Biden. Not solving everything, but at least setting up that conversation. And as Brendan said, the G20 agreed to phase out fossil fuels subsidies in 2009 in the Pittsburgh summit that the US hosted following the last great financial crisis. We're 2020 and we're still talking about the G20 phasing out fossil fuel subsidies. So, you know, people, you know, so I do think, you know, um, we've got to get a bit more serious. And I think a bit, um, and we've got to, I think, regardless of the Biden administration, we'll have to sort of do some of the things. He said he was going to do, even if, and, and think through then the politics around that and how we rebuild politics. We can't not do that stuff because the science says we have to, and Biden knows that and takes that sort of responsibility, I think, very seriously. And then we're going to have to sort out the politics, right? And that's, I think, what the next four years are going to be about. For, for, for progressives around the world, I think, including in the UK post Brexit.
And just to jump in with a, a few quick thoughts on that, um, I think it really is going to be uh, one of the existential questions and, and, and struggles that uh, the Democrats are going to be faced with after this election is, do they go the Republican route and kind of do the take no prisoners, you know, no holds barred, whatever it takes to get their agenda done route? Or do they, and they're not an either or, but, or do they do a kind of more constructive, find, you know, ways that they can work together, build a tent, and create some bipartisan consensus that can actually maybe have a little bit more durability and last over successive changes in administration. And I don't know if there's a right answer to that. I think there's a lot of it. It's a, it's a spectrum. And so um, I think that's going to be something we're really grappling with, um, you know, as, as we move forward into the coming months. I think, you know, what is really clear going back to, uh, to what we were talking about, some of the polling that Katie and others uh, mentioned before, is that overwhelmingly Americans of both parties, Democrat and Republican, support the transition to a clean energy economy. That is a, a, an absolute fact. So it's how we actually sell that and make that more real, more immediate for people. Um, you know, even Fox News had polls showing, you know, 70% of people, uh, you know, coming out of the polls supported a uh, transition to, to clean energy. So I think one thing we can think about is, is climate is so intersectional and, and touches every single issue. So if you're thinking about how to make that case and that, that story more appealing to people, if you are trying to reach out to independents or Republicans, you know, maybe it's more less through the direct climate lens, maybe it's more through the, the business lens, the climate security lens, resilience lens, the kind of fiscal lens, uh, just given the, the impact that climate change uh, is going to have on the U.S.'s kind of fiscal standing. Um, so it, again, it may not be directly through the climate frame all the time. Some cases it might be, but I think we need to expand a little bit and think about other ways to tie into to people's immediate priorities, whether that's on the economy, health inequality, or what have you. Can I, can I just jump in on that one point, Jess? I think because we could see, for example, a bipartisan infrastructure bill, right, with stimulus. And in that infrastructure, you know, when we get, it could be t like solar wind infrastructure and just may not say on the tin, green infrastructure or green stimulus. So I think to Brendan's point, there's a lot we can do that would underpin a credible NDC. Uh, it just may not, you know, it just may not say on the tin. Yeah, Katie, I'd be interested to hear your view on this debate about, you know, do the, do the Democrats go down a kind of no-holds-barred approach or, or take a more um, compromising approach, particularly because you were saying the evolution of the youth climate movement is to run for seats in the Senate. And, um, you know, does that, does that mean um, that eventually you do have to accept some level of compromise? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm still holding out hope for these two Senate seats, so I'm, I'm not writing it off yet. But, um, you know, I will say that I think that what the youth movement has that's sort of in our advantage is that there are, as, as Brendan said, you know, there's a number of young leaders in the conservative party that are climate champions that are really, you know, strong advocates for their party to, um, you know, take action when it comes to climate. I think the other thing that that's, you know, playing in our favor more so than when Biden was in office Office, or excuse me, when um, uh, Obama was in office, um, is that the fossil fuel industry is a dying industry now. You know, it's not, it is not as um, lucrative and successful as it has been in the past. And so I think that there are going to be windows of opportunity for Republicans to, um, you know, see opportunities with, with renewables, with a, with, a, with a transition to a green economy. And so I do think that there are um, opportunities for bipartisanship. And I think as much as, um, you know, Biden was not the pick for the youth movement, I think that, you know, he's, he's been in a very strong position to sort of play that role of, of, of bringing some um, some of the folks from the right um, to sort of be stronger champions on climate. Um, and then I think the other thing is really, you know, analyzing our strategy as a movement of, you know, how we're talking to, you know, Democrats versus Republicans. I mean, I think that there's been a lot of criticism, rightfully so, you know, in my opinion, around the youth movement and how we villainize members of the Democratic Party leadership as far as with their inaction on climate, um, rather than sort of targeting Republican leadership um, and doing it potentially in a more strategic way, um, you know, uh, 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 we, we, you know, sort of as uh, uh, we were talking, just joking around with some of my colleagues yesterday, um, is that, you know, Lindsey Graham, ha Graham has grandchildren, Mitch McConnell has grandchildren, and those that, you know, those young people probably are very interested in seeing, you know, climate um, solutions. And so why are we not talking to them? You know, why are we not appealing to them to sort of work sort of more of an inside game um, to sort of move, uh, move that sort of that older generation to a place where they're feeling strong about climate? Um, and so I think that there is actually a lot of sort of windows of opportunity 
opportunity, you know, with Biden and administration to sort of expand what we're looking at when it comes to climate policy. Um, and the last thing I'll say again is going back to this, this sort of looking at this financial pillar and how that that's continuing to enable and hold up the fossil fuel industry um, and working on a strategy that's really sort of turning um, our forces toward them and villainizing them. Um, and I think that that really kind of provides um, a, a whole different narrative again and a different pathway toward not only getting um, you know Republican Party leadership to um, potentially sort of fall in line and 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 potentially do more bold action when it comes to climate, um, but I think when it comes to Democratic leadership as well, we could potentially see you know more movement um, in sort of in in thinking about who we're villainizing and sort of thinking about where we're turning our movement energy toward. Thank you. That's great. So we've just got a couple of minutes left. I just want to ask each of you if you had one single piece of policy advice for the new president, and I'll let you decide who that's going to be, um, what, would it, what would it be? Um, and I want it to be very specific, not like just rejoin Paris, you know, like something very, very specific. And uh, you've got like one minute each, I would say. So I'm going to start with uh, Katie. Um, I hope I can have a second to think about it. Um, I would say I think that um, Biden, I would assume, hopefully it's Biden, knock on wood, um, is that a Biden administration has an opportunity to be a leader when it comes to climate justice in a way that um, we've never seen from a president before or from a high ranking, I think, um, a leader in this country as a whole. And when I say climate justice, I say that because I think that we are at a point, we are at a real sort of pivotal turning point where we can decide, are we going to sort of continue going down this path of um, sort of looking at environment, looking at climate as a very, you know, polar bears and penguins issues versus a really people issue. And I think if Biden can take day one in office, you know, take this lens of and you know, we're seeing it already building back better, take this lens of recovering from COVID in a way that's gonna set us up to avoid climate catastrophe in the future. I think it's a very powerful story and I think it opens up windows to see policy that we would otherwise not gonna be able to see. So I would say um, from the Biden administration, really hoping to see sort of in that transition plan, in that building back better plan, that that is gonna be done through a climate lens and really having climate as a forefront issue um, in, in, in sort of that policy going forward. Thank you. And Brendan. Yeah, no, just, just building on that. Um, I, I think um, really foremost priority is making sure that climate, clean energy, uh, you know, whatever we're, we're branding as a label on it uh, is front and center, uh, a part of the, the stimulus package. That's obviously where there's going to be so many billions of dollars and what really did help to kind of give a, give a, you know, a jumpstart to the Obama administration in terms of their recovery efforts providing, uh, you know, clean energy, uh, you know, incentives. So I think as much as they can be pushing that, again, it doesn't have to be branded, you know, climate with a big sticker on it. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, really showing some of those benefits, again, very local, locally showing how these investments that they're making can help get people, uh, you know, cleaner air, cleaner water, better livelihoods, again, to, to Katie's point, a fairer and more, more just society. I think uh, as much as they can do that and have people really see the immediate benefits of taking climate action, not just the sort of theoretical, uh, you know, side of, of the kind of policy wonk, uh, the policy want peace and then again be weaving that story and the narrative as we've been talking about uh, about how all these things are actually building a better future for people uh, and, and affecting their lives on a day-to-day -day basis uh, I think if they can do something like that that'll set them off on a really good foot uh, to do other other things in their in their uh, in their term thanks and Claire you can't say climate justice or green recovery okay <laughs> so I would say um do what you said you were going to do, create potentially a central, like a national climate council on par with say the National Economic Council or National Security Council within the White House architecture and make it a whole of economy, that's another buzzword, uh, approach to this issue. So whatever, whatever any of the agencies are doing, right, and whoever he appoints in terms of his personnel uh, leading these agencies, they're given the mandate to, within their department, within their portfolio, like decarbonize as fast and as fair as possible. And so we see it, we, you know, we've got to heart rewire the economy and we start to see that, again, as Brendan says, whatever it's, whatever it's called, but across the treasury, across the problem of commerce and trade and agriculture, 
uh, as well as the energy department, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's hardwired in to uh, as fast as possible um, into this sort of economic recovery agenda. That's what I want to see. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all of my speakers today, Katie, um, Claire and Brendan, and of course, Chris for man managing the q and I'm really sorry if not everyone's questions got asked. The uh, Green Alliance are recording this, so it will be on YouTube tomorrow. So please do, do check that out. So thank you very much.